is there a plan that, that somebody's following? Is there an Omega plan uh, that is being followed here? And certainly we have an Omega plan given for us in the scriptures. Lots of detail throughout the Old Testament and, of course, the New Testament, the book of Revelation, etc., describing end times events, what's going to happen, when, and how. Um, but I think the global elite or worldwide elite, whatever we want to say, um, are following an agenda, following a plan. And so the next <laughs> blog I wrote was called The Omega Plan. Um, and I didn't go very far back. I'm sure we could go way further back than this. I just went as far back as September 11th, 1990, when George H. announced his plan for a new world order. September 11th, 1990. In 1999, Zahi Hawass discovers the tomb of Osiris. September 11th, 2001, 11 years to the day, an attack, quote unquote, occurred on U.S. soil, which would change the world and accelerate the advancement of the new world order. Why all of this stuff around, why 9-11? Well, we read about when Apollo shows up, Revelation 9-11. But I believe even that is a counterfeit. I think 9-11 has uh, even more significance uh, for us to be paying attention to. I believe it's the birth date, the date our Savior was born. Um, based on Revelation 12, 1 through 5, what we see about this sign, a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman arrayed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, travailing in birth and in pain to be delivered. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads seven diadems. And his tail draweth a third part of the stars of heaven, and to cast them down to the earth. And the dragon standeth before the woman that is about to be delivered, that she, when she, that when she is delivered... He may devour her child. And she was delivered of a son, a man child, who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and unto his throne. I believe this is a stellar alignment describing the birth of Christ. Some people disagree with this and say this is a future event because they take all of Revelation to be a future event. And they say this represents the church. Well, the church is feminine. It's his bride. This says that it's a man child. Is the church going to rule all nations? Does the church have a rod of iron? Who has the rod of iron? Yeshua does. This can only represent the birth of Yeshua. It can't represent the birth of the church or whatever the, you know, the, the futurists are trying to say. Um, and so I was looking at that, and there's a free software. You could go uh, to Stellarium, Stellarium.org, download the software. And then the last chapter of my book, I actually give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. Download the free software, uh, follow the directions, and you can actually, I would say, back up to August 28th, 3 BC, which is negative 2 in the software. Uh, and from August 28th to September 11th, there's a magnificent dance of the stars that takes place, where the stars are moving into position to, to reach this sign. Fantastic. And uh, Dr. Michael Heiser talks about this also. I'll play a clip from him. The signs and symbols that are used in Revelation 12 are well-known astronomical symbols. Here's a superimposed picture over it. Now we have Scorpio and Libra, the scales, but in the ancient times this was one known as the dragon. Uh, you have a very small window of time where all of these things can be present at the same time where everything is accounted for. The sun was clothing the woman, the king star, king planet in Leo, the sign for the tribe of Judah. All of these things did occur in a year that fits well for Jesus' birth, and that is 3 BC. The real sort of interesting thing about 3 BC is, is since this concatenation of signs uh, can only occur in an 80-minute window. We know exactly uh, the date of the birth of the Messiah in 3 BC, and that date is September 11th. So he confirms it also. I, he talked about it that it took place in an 80-minute window of time. I believe that was probably the duration of her labor. She was in labor for 80 minutes, and boom, there it is. Now, if you look up that sign and, and look at the, the moon at her feet, it's in a new moon phase, which means that, that that's Tishri 1. Now, I know a lot of people think he was born in the Feast of Tabernacles. I've heard a lot of compelling arguments for that. I just so happen to disagree with them based on this sign right here. The arguments for Tabernacles are, are they're convincing and they're interesting, um, 
But, I mean, this is, I mean, how much more precise can you get than an 80-minute sign in human history that just so happens to perfectly fit Revelation 12, 1 through 5, happening in a phase when the new, it's a new moon, which is Tishri 1. The, one of the arguments for the tabernacle birth is that, you know, let's say, well, he, he tabernacled among us. Well, actually, if he was born in the beginning of tabernacles, Tishri 15, he wouldn't have been able to tabernacle among us because there's a seven-day period of uncleanliness where the baby and the mother have to isolate themselves until the time of uncleanliness is, is completed. So he couldn't have tabernacled among us if he was born in Tabernacle 1 because they would have spent the whole time being isolated. Whereas if he was born in Tishri 1, you know, he'd go through the seven-day purification process and then circumcised on day 8, and then you have the Day of Atonement on day 10, then they're totally free to tabernacle among us through the whole week of Sukkot. The other problem with Sukkot is the command during Sukkot is for all males to be in Jerusalem. Well, that's not a good way for the sinless lamb to get started, violating the commandment by he and Joseph being in Bethlehem, when the command during Sukkot is to be in Jerusalem. So I reject the Sukkot birth and think there's a much stronger case for the Tishri 1, September 11th, on the Gregorian calendar, date of a Messiah. Um, but, of course, you've got everybody, and we all did it too, celebrating his birthday on December 25th. Meanwhile, on 9-11, on the date of his birth, we've got this event right here. And so, I mean, can you just imagine anybody running around singing it's the most wonderful time of the year now on September 11th? Actually, I've started to do that, trying to create a little bit of a revolution, <laughs> a, a new way of thinking, trying to get, you know, people on Facebook and whatnot to start thinking differently. So, I, I, no, I understand Tishri 1 doesn't always fall on September 11th, you know, because it slides on the Gregorian calendar. So I'll actually do it twice. <laughs> on September 11th, just to make the point, I'll do a, a birthday thing, happy birthday, Jesus, or Yeshua, on September 11th. And then, of course, really go all out on Tishri 1 with uh, various evidence and stuff for him being born on the Feast of Trumpets and drawing people's attention to the Feast of the Lord. Um, but I think that was strategic on the devil's part to really put a, an infamous stain on that date and also to get us all off of the Feast of the Lord and get us on Beast Feast doing stuff that really honor and ce celebrate Nimrod. You know, the, the Christmas tree is a phallic symbol. And I'm sorry, Jeremiah 10, in my opinion, is talking about the Christmas tree. You, you, behold, you cut a tree out of the forest and you drag it into your, you know, and you set it upright and you deck it with silver and gold. Uh, well, you know, the detractors out there say, no, that's talking about carving a tree into an idol and worshiping it. Like, uh, excuse me, it says you took a tree out of the forest, brought it in, stood it upright, and decked it with, so, deck the halls with, you know, you know, people are doing this thing, and they set this up as a centerpiece in their living room, and they bow down before it to place presents, and they bow down before it to take presents. That looks like idol worship to me. Anybody standing outside looking in would say, well, you know, that's what it looks like. In my opinion, Jeremiah 10 is absolutely talking about the Christmas tree. And, you know, fortunately, Sheila and I were on the same page. And, and you know, I don't know if everybody here had experienced the same thing. But before we started coming into an understanding of Torah, we went through a, a rather lengthy season of just being disgusted with the church. Any church we went to. We're like something, you know, it was like here's a seven point, seven week PowerPoint presentation on prison break, you know, you know, and they're like trying to be culturally relevant using all these TV shows, and the whole sermon is you know trying to get you matched up with whatever is going on in the latest TV show, and you know, you know, the rock service, you know, rock band service taking place for praise and worship and stuff. Don't get me wrong, I love that kind of music, but everything just felt like a show. It felt like a game show. And sometimes they were doing game shows, you know. And we were like, man, you know, and it was Black Friday, 2009. I hate Black Friday anyway uh, because on Thursday we're all thanking everybody for, you know, Thanksgiving so wonderful, and then on Friday we're killing each other for Tickle Me Elmo. <laughs> um, now, to be fair, you can get a lot of good deals on Black Friday, right? So, yeah, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Yeah, I was, uh, I was at Fry's Electronics getting some good deals, you know, because I like computer parts and stuff. Uh, that's called being frugal with my money. <laughs> but I'm sitting in the parking lot just disgusted by the whole thing, but there was a deep, like, there was a darkness, a heaviness that was sitting on top of me that was over and above my disgust for Black Friday. 
And I was like, Lord, what is this? I don't know what's going on. And I didn't know it at the time. I found out later. But Sheila was going through the same thing in another part of town, just feeling, eh, something's not right. And I was like, Lord, I got, man, I don't know what this is. I, I need to pray with somebody to help me out here. And so I got my phone out, and I was going through my contact list, and I got to my friend Kevin Roberts, and uh, the father just said him. So I said, okay. I called Kevin. He prayed with me, and then he says, hey, Rob, um, uh, Amanda and I, we're going to go to a, a Torah study tomorrow at the Christian bookstore. You want to go? I'm thinking, Torah study at the Christian bookstore? It's just like, what? <laughs> you know, that, yeah, that sounded really weird to me. But we were disgusted. I mean, we had been church hopping for a while, couldn't find anything. We did church on a pillow for a while where we just lay in bed and find somebody on the radio or the internet to listen to and even that was not working so we're like yeah why not you know so we went and it was the Torah portion uh, I think it was week number nine if I remember right where Joseph is sold into slavery and the the facilitator said draw a line down the center of your page and write Joseph on the left and Yeshua on the right and how many parallels can you find between the life of Joseph and the life of Yeshua go ahead and write it Never, I had never spent, I mean, I was familiar with some of the typology and stuff, but I never really spent any time really thinking about that, so I did. Just off the top of my head, I came up with 25 parallels between Joseph and Yeshua. And then when everybody else had finished, we all began to share with each other, I had like almost 50, I was blown away. Like, this is the first time I'm nibbling on steak when I've been sucking on milkshakes for years. I'm like, wow! So we went back the next week, and the next week, and next, you know, haven't looked back since. It's just been absolutely amazing. I learned more in the first year of doing that than in 40 years prior of doing, you know, the standard church model thing. And so, you know, that's when all these things start popping out to, and, and coming out to me. And I'm like, guys, when it came to the Christmas and Easter stuff, I had already spent, I had written seven chapters in my book, I think seven chapters, and uh, and I was like. Okay, I'm done. The last cha- what I thought was going to be the last chapter was called Coming Out of Babylon. And yeah, the seventh chapter was Coming Out of Babylon. I thought, okay, I'm done. And basically, I was ready to close the book, and, and Father said, ah, ah, you've got to come out of Babylon too. Well, I'm not in Babylon, Lord. Because I was thinking geopolitical, you know, our troops leaving Iraq, blah, blah, blah. No. All this Christmas Easter stuff. And I used to love that stuff. I was a mall Santa, okay? <laughs> now, now, obviously, I had to be loaded up with some fat pads to make that work, but. I was a mall Santa. I toured the country with Alvin and the Chipmunks and Mother Goose. As, and I was, <laughs> in the summer, I, I was David's, yeah, Alvin! You know, I was, I was that guy. In the winter, uh, I was Santa Claus. Another guy played David Seville. Loved that stuff. I used to write, direct, and produce passion plays and play Jesus on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Loved that stuff. But after doing this research, it was easy for me to drop it. Like, pfft, done. And Sheila and I both, we just went cold turkey. If you're hearing this for the first time, all I can say is start praying. Next time you go to celebrate those holidays, ask Father if he's pleased with it. See what happens. He'll show you. Um, Again, I began to wonder if we're off by two years because of of the event that I saw on December 21st, 2010. Some of you were not here, and I I talked about this yesterday, but... um, on December 21st, 2010, when I saw this blood red moon go over the shoulder of Orion like a decapitated head, um, and I came back and started doing research, I found out while that was happening here, nighttime in the United States, daytime in the Middle East, the, the Iraqi government is saying, hey, we're back in business again. Iraq was announcing its fully formed government. The entire planet started shaking. The uh, seismographic monitors that check earthquake activity were all going into black. The whole planet was shaking, the earth was shaking. Um, we had massive fish and bird die-offs where we, if you remember the reports of thousands of birds falling from the sky and fish beaching themselves, then they added the 13th sign to the zodiac, Ophiuchus, who was known for raising Orion from the dead. I'm like, honey, something's going on here! <laughs> and, but that was September 21st, 2010. Everybody was looking forward to 2012. But if the sign of Jesus' birth is accurate on the Gregorian calendar, that's negative two which means the calendar's off by two years. Continuing with the timeline here, uh, after 9-11, 2001, the United States government has imposed the Patriot Act, uh, begun monitoring every area of our lives. Hello, NSA, CIA, FBI, we know you're listening. Because unless the battery has been taken out of your phone, they can monitor everything you're doing. Repent, get saved. You call yourself a patriot, read the Constitution. You're violating it right now. Those of you who are listening, 
looking for terrorists because the um, war on terror is, is a fraud. War is terror. So how do you wage terror to get rid of terror? It's not a war against a people, a nation. It's a war against an idea conjured up in a Luciferian's mind that will never, ever end. Because what happens when a superior force attacks an inferior force? And if that inferior force is actually innocent, what is the only resort that person has to fight the superior force? Guerrilla warfare. That's the only choice they have. They don't have a no, they don't have the equipment we have, so all they can do is wage guerrilla warfare. So if somebody comes right through these doors right here, accusing us of something we didn't do and wastes half of us in here and leaves the other half, you know, bleeding to death and somebody rescues us and, you know, people are angry because of their loved ones that are killed, all you're going to do is create a terrorist group that's going to want vengeance on what just happened in this room. When you realize box cutter toting terrorists had nothing to do with 9-11, then the wars that we waged over there were totally and completely unjustified. Now, yes, there are bad people over there doing bad things. I get that. But let's go back to the cause for the 10 years that we were over there, you know, nine years or whatever it was. That was all based on a lie. I'm right above one side. Was I told? I'm trying to pocket the fire. But she's never knocked it down two lines. Where you in? They know that. 78th floor. And it's not. We got two. I'm trying to pocket the fire. We got two. Isolated pockets of fire. Two water lines to knock them down. FEMA's executive summary relays that much of the fuel in the planes, jet grade kerosene, was consumed by the initial fireballs and the following few minutes of fire. The Twin Towers were composed of 200,000 tons of steel and 425,000 cubic yards of concrete. The core of each tower was a rectangular pillar 87 by 133 feet comprised of 47 steel box columns ranging from 36 by 16 to 52 by 22 inches. An analysis released in 1964 claims that the buildings were investigated and found to be safe in an assumed collision with a 707 traveling at 600 miles per hour. Such collision would result in only local damage which could not cause collapse or substantial damage to the building. Inside there was the core a rectangle of 47 columns made of four inch thick steel at the base, thinning with increasing height. The cores combined might with ingenuity. The story we were told, this rock-like steel grid gave way because fire warped the trusses, causing the bolts to fail. As the trusses sagged and fell, the floors dropped with them. In its 2002 documentary, Why the Towers Fell, PBS creates a video model. Once the trusses failed, the floors they were holding cascade down with a force too great to be withstood. The result is what's called a progressive collapse, as each floor pancakes down onto the one below. What remains standing? The tall, indestructible core. Why does PBS fail to explain the complete disappearance of the Twin Towers cores? Since the black smoke coming from the buildings means that the fire was oxygen starved and could not have reached its maximum temperature of 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, and steel melts at a much higher temperature of 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly 700 degrees hotter than the maximum temperature of the fire, how could cleanup crews have found melted steel in the basements? Why did Fire Engineering Magazine tell us that no steel building has ever been destroyed by fire? That the World Trade Center investigation was a half-baked farce? How do these firefighters describe the collapse of the North Tower? We started one. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, detonated. If they were planned to yeah. take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. Chief Albert Turry told me that there was another explosion which took place. So according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. 
almost looks like one of those planned implosions. As if a demolition team set off, when you see the old demolitions of these old buildings, it My folded God. down on itself and it is not My there God. anymore. Generally speaking, for a building to collapse in on itself like that, it would seem to indicate that there could have been an explosion, a bomb planted on the ground that would make the building collapse within itself. By that evening, eyewitnesses and experts alike were rushing to defend the official narrative of events, claiming that raging jet fuel fires melted the steel inside the Twin Towers. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. Carlene Davis is the Dean of Architecture at the University of Tennessee. She calls the 110-story tall twin tower tube structures. That means there are no internal columns holding it up. You know, when we saw this yesterday, people said, oh my goodness, there was a bomb on there. There must have been a bomb that must collapsed. must have been a bomb it. below right. that, that, that finished the job. Well, it turns out we heard from uh, experts who said that, you know what, the, the fire on those floors, probably 1,500 degrees. Steel can only withstand so much because the steel structure that holds the building up was on the outside and essentially the building started to melt and it gave way and it toppled steel will melt no steel building has ever been destroyed by fire just who was behind the terror attacks larry silverstein became landlord on july 24th less than two months before the attack he then had control of the maintenance and security departments and he began to replace security personnel. Silverstein brought Frank Lowy into the deal to become landlord of the underground shopping mall. Lowy is a billionaire who owns shopping malls in several nations. After the towers disintegrated, Silverstein demanded insurance companies pay him twice what the policy stated, on the grounds that each tower underwent separate attacks. What a coincidence that after these guys got control of the World Trade Center, Osama bin Laden decided to destroy the entire complex. CBS's Jim Stewart in Washington has been tracking events all day and has the latest, Jim. We are told rescue workers have recovered a passport and the debris that belonged to one of the dead hijackers. Another development on Saturday, New York officials revealed at a news conference here in the city that a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. Well, Dan, not far from here, a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers. Evidence this disaster scene is also a crime scene. These passports are so magical and so wonderful that like golems ring, they call to you. They call to who they want to find them, but not any normal mortal. No, 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 no. The ring calls out only to FBI agents. The 9-11 Commission says the CVRs and FDRs from American 11 and United 175 were not found. Yet, the FBI claims to have found the passport of Satam al sakami which managed to fly out of his pocket through the explosion and onto the streets of Manhattan below. So, four different black boxes, made from the most resilient materials known to man, were destroyed. Yet, a passport, made from a fragile material known as paper, managed to survive? Who writes this stuff? In 2006, during the trial of Zacharias Massawi, the FBI managed to provide a multitude of evidence that appears to have survived a catastrophic crash in near pristine condition. Among the exhibits were a red bandana and a Kingdom of Saudi Arabia driver's license. Although a 757 managed to obliterate itself upon impact, paper and fabric managed to survive without a scratch. A six-month investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee concluded in December 2006 that Able Danger did not identify Muhammad Atta or any other 9-11 hijacker. Can we be certain that the hijackers were radical Muslims on a suicide mission? Or is there a possibility that they were trained, funded, and protected in our own country? Where is this mysterious chart that purportedly says that Otto was connected in some real way to these other hijackers. We'd love to see it. The company responsible for the chart 
Orion Scientific Systems would claim that only two charts were produced and that Ada was not present on either one. These charts were all done by the data mining efforts. So the Orion Corporation lied to the Senate Judiciary Committee staff. All data mining efforts, and yet the company said to the Senate Judiciary staff, we don't have any of those charts, they're not ours. Well, here they are, and their logos are on each one of them. And last but not least, Mohammed Atta's father claimed to receive a phone call from his son on September 12th. On September 20th and 27th, Mueller admitted on CNN that there is no legal proof to prove the identities of the hijackers. So, if there's no proof that the hijackers were members of Al-Qaeda, or if they were even on the plane in the first place, what justification do we have for bombing Afghanistan? They're creating terrorists by the war on terror. And they know that. War is big business. When you realize how many of our political leaders are heavily invested in the military industrial complex and how much money they make off the stocks that they have in Halliburton and all these other things, man, it's to their advantage to continue to keep us at war with somebody all the time. I'm as patriotic as they come. I love my country. I served proudly for eight years and I was a Boy Scout before that. Love this country, but I don't agree with what's going on now. And I tell people all the time, and they say, hey, Rob, would you recommend my son go in the military? I say, absolutely, positively, no way, no. Uh-uh. Because not only are they going to send you to unjust, unconstitutional wars, but they're going to use your kid as a guinea pig for anything they want. When you go to boot camp, they line you up, and they shoot all kinds of stuff in their arm, and they, they don't even tell you what it is. Did you have to go through the inoculation line when you were in, in the military? Uh, some, one point in time, yeah. Yeah. In basic training, they march us in, guy on either side with air guns, <laughs> Yeah. What'd they put in me? You know? Yeah. I, no way. The NDAA, look, at, look that up. Look up the NDAA. They have stripped our rights completely. The Bill of Rights, what's that? No. Nope. April 2003, the Tomb of Gilgamesh and his body was discovered. The United States military occupation began the following month. Our U.S. soldiers raided the Museum of Baghdad. I told you about the 3,000 items. This is interesting. J.P. Morgan J Chase led a 13-bank consortium to establish the Central Bank of Iraq. All you have to do to figure out where the next war is going to be is look where they don't have a central bank. Then what do you know? After the war, <laughs> they're going to have a central bank. And the same people who set up the Central Bank of Iraq were the ones that set up our central bank. J.P. Morgan leads a 13-bank, 13, really 13, 13-bank consortium and uh, they topple the regime, you know, we get rid of um, Saddam Hussein and all that stuff, and they get rid of all the old Iraqi dinar money, and they create new currency, the new Iraqi dinar. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with what's going on with that, but they basically devalued the dinar. At one time, the dinar is worth $3.22. It would cost us $3.22, 322 is another one of those numbers. Skull and Bones Society, the Skull and Bones logo is a pile of two bones, like the, you know, the old pirates with the, shit, the skull on top, you know, like you see on the ships, and underneath it, 322. The Iraqi dinar was worth $3.22 for one of their dinar. We had to pay that much. They devalued the currency to 3,000 dinar to one U.S. dollar. So it went from one of the most expensive, most valued currencies in the world to absolute monopoly money. Then they brought in uh, De La Rue, one of the premier currency uh, printers in the world, to print up the new Iraqi dinar, and they put some of the most high-tech anti-counterfeit measures on, of any other currency on this monopoly money. I mean, it's got magnetic strips, it's got holograms, watermarks, all this stuff. Why did they, why did they hire the most premier currency guy, uh, uh, company and put some of the most high-tech anti-counterfeit currency measures on one of the most worthless currencies out there? Now, there's others that are even less than that, but something's going on. And a buddy of mine who is in the um, uh, Airborne uh, Special Forces guy, he called me up one day and he says, Rob, I got to ask you, I know you like to research, I want you to look, up some, look into something for me. I said, okay, what's up? He said, um, I got a, buddy, a bunch of my buddies that are still in the special forces over there in Iraq, and um, they don't want to get paid in U.S. currency. They're all wanting to get paid in Iraqi dinar, which doesn't make sense for an enlisted guy. I don't know what it was like when you were in and what your rank was, but the enlisted guys in the military, they don't get paid much. Two dollar bills. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't get paid much at all. In fact, it, it's pretty pathetic when 
when our, our young men and women over there, and, s and some of them in positions of leadership, higher ranking sergeants and whatnot, have to go on food stamps just to feed their family while they're laying down their life and limb uh, for our so-called freedom. It's disgusting. But for these guys who aren't getting paid much to begin with to say we don't want to get paid in U.S. currency, we want to get paid in Monopoly money that's 3000 to one U.S. dollar, makes no sense at all. So he's like, what, why would, what, what do they know? <laughs> why were they doing it? Well, in the early days, it was 3001. It slowly appreciated in value. Actually, it made a pretty quick jump from 3000 to 1 to about 1000 to 1. And that's roughly where it still is. It's, it's, it hovers 1173, 1160, whatever. It's hovering around roughly 1000 to 1. But it has appreciated from the 3000 to 1000 to, to 1. Well, I don't know what's going to happen with that. And look, I am not licensed or in any way qualified to give anybody financial advice. Disclaimer aside, okay? No, I made the disclaimer. There's no reason you should listen to anything I have to say, and I'm not qualified to give you financial advice. But you'll waste a dollar going to the movies, going out to eat, you know, waste 100 bucks. When you get, get, you get 100,000 dinar for 100 bucks, and if it happens to revalue, how you doing? When it goes to 1,000 to 1 to 1 to 1. Or if it goes from 1,000 to 1 to 3 to 1, to its original, what they call it, not a, it's an RV or an RI, revalue or a reinstatement. If it reinstates to its prior value, how you doing? So you know that the, the, the worldwide, you know, the elite, the bankers, when it was 3,001, when they did this, you know they got an awful lot of dinar, a ton of it. And China was buying it up like crazy too because they know something. What got me most intrigued by that is when you look in Revelation and uh, was it the third seal, I believe, where it talks about um, uh, it'll cost a day's wage for food? Well, in Greek, it's denarius. It'll cost a denarius for food. Well, denarius is from which we get the word dinar. You know, it comes from denarius. So I'm going, huh, that's interesting. So the last day's currencies is going to be a dinar, according to that seal. Um, worth looking into. You'll, you'll waste more money going to the movies. Anyway, 2008, plans were set in motion to collapse the current world reserve, which is the USD. 2010, the United States economy collapsed, taking much of the world down with us and paving the way for a one world currency. Now, this hasn't happened yet, but you can see, if you look at 2008, what happened with the markets and whatnot, you can see where things are headed. And they're, they're always talking about the big financial collapse is coming, right? I mean, how many trillions of dollars are we in debt right now? But of course, all of that could change like that with a revalue of the Iraqi dinar. It would reset everybody's economy. And if we believe that the first Babylon will be the last Babylon, like the title of my book, The First Shall Be the Last, then you know, I know a lot of people out there saying the United States is Babylon or New York is Babylon. I, I understand the arguments, but I'm going to go with a biblical interpretation. They had no idea of New York and the United States and all indications, especially with the Yahuwah Triangle series that I was talking about. Um, those are the three points that the Bible bounces around. Egypt, Israel, Assyria, Babylon, as in Iraq. So if that's the case, then obviously things have to change such that that place becomes a pretty hopping area for everybody to later mourn what happens. So could it be that top dog U.S. eventually is toppled or done away with or what have you, and then it, everything raises up over there. I don't know, but after we left there, we left 500 military bases and millions, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars worth of state-of-the-art military equipment, and we built the largest embassy in the world there. Something's going on. December 21st, 2010, his nation, Nimrod's nation, was born again out of the ashes like a phoenix as a blood-red moon floated over the shoulders of Orion like a decapitated head, and the, and the entire planet shook. Our soldiers have been at war for nearly a decade, waging urban warfare. On December 11th, our troops were ordered out of Iraq, leaving behind hundreds of millions of dollars worth of military equipment and bases. December 31st, 2011, Obama signed the NDAA into law, making it, imp making it possible to indefinitely detain American citizens without trial or legal representation, simply for being suspected of being a terrorist. And that definition of terrorist is whatever they make up for the day. Well, yeah, absolutely. Oh, you want to get together and listen to this crazy Rob Skiba guy talk about flat earth and the Bible and all kinds of stuff like that? Terrorists! Mm -hmm. That's all they have to do. Right, because I'm going to say, in the deals that 
we're against Washington D.C. because it's the sun, it's it's yeah. Nimrod. That, and, that's all they have to do is and, whatever they decide. And make us yeah, basically, the, the United States, unfortunately, is following the Nazi playbook to the letter. If you just look at what, it, what Hitler and the SS and what they did with the Reichstag and everything that led to what they did thereafter, it's following the same formula. Now, I gave you an outline of what I was seeing in my research. Now I'm going to play a video for you that, is, that shows our U.S. presidents and mainstream news uh, reports and things like that illustrating what I've been talking about playing out right before our eyes. Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. On August the 17th, 1991, Desert Shield became Desert Storm. The conflict witnessed by millions through the eye of CNN and the BBC, showing propaganda of the systematic eradication of Saddam's forces by a coalition far superior in technological, political and economic power. The orchestrators of the war were by no means strangers to controlling major world events. In fact, they have done so for centuries. From the shadows, they have engineered every major war, revolution and recession. They control everything you read, everything you hear, and everything you see. They have managed to indoctrinate an entire populace to their way of thinking, and have infiltrated key positions in places of authority. And it is from the shadows that they have created a new political order, a new economic order, and more sinister, a new religious order. Their ultimate aim is total global domination, and they will stop at nothing to reach their goal. The goal that was outlined in a speech given by former President of the United States, George Bush. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. We talk so much about dispelling this. How about confirming one? What is this? Susie, this is the tomb of Osiris. The god of the underworld, his once extravagant mausoleum, a moat with four pillars engraved with hieroglyphics constructed thousands of years ago, was intended to be a shrine for the keeper of the afterlife. Polls have just now closed in six additional states representing 66 electoral votes. We must follow no other course. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. We will confront weapons of mass destruction. We will build our defenses beyond challenge, lest weakness invite challenge. This work continues. The story goes on. And an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. Another plane just hit the World Trade Center. Wait, oh my God, oh my God, the building fell. We have no idea what caused this. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine and live with pink haired strippers managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. 
the administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination. Because... Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. You will never, ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. Imagine the startling proposition that the Nephilim, the giants, the mighty men of old, gods and children of the Watchers, could somehow rise up, could somehow be reconstituted inside of a body. And, of course, I've discussed with you before my theory that one of the greatest legends in history could be a record of that having actually happened. And I'm referring to Nimrod, who some scholars also identify as Gilgamesh of Sumerian fame, Apollo of Greek fame, Osiris of Egyptian fame. And this Gilgamesh was a giant who a lot of people didn't even believe was anything more than myth until his grave marker was found a few years back. And then, according to some people, the military swooped in and took possession and control of that dig. Hey, Tom, I want to interject something. I talked to a special operations general who was there when Gilgamesh's remains, and, and his words were he was in a state of remarkable preservation, okay? He said they have Gilgamesh's remains. So if they have Gilgamesh and he is Nimrod, they got it. And the whole point was to extract the DNA. When the Iraqi regime fell in April 2003, the Iraqi Museum in Baghdad and museums in other provinces such as Mosul, Basra and Babur were exposed to theft for two consecutive days. The theft was carried out by local and international networks as well as Iraqi and Arab agents. It is estimated that 170,000 artifacts were stolen, 15,000 of which have no registration records. The most important of these artifacts are the Sumerian cuneiforms, which represents the philosophy of life and death. Many date back to Mesopotamian times more than 4,000 years ago. Artifacts pertaining to the civilizations of the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Chaldeans, and others that go back thousands of years in history, were taken away from the land of the two rivers. In addition, entire book collections from certain historic eras disappeared from the National Library, thus negatively affecting Iraq's wealth of civilization and culture. One must also mention that some artifacts were stolen and sent to Israel via the American forces. But American troops stood by as Iraq's heritage was plundered. One memorable moment that week was when Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld dismissed the looting in Baghdad as unimportant. 
Freedom's untidy, and free people are free to make mistakes and commit crimes and do bad things. Many of the looters knew which objects they were looking for and where to find them. In other words, they were insiders. Investigations revealed that the main metal gate of the storage rooms was opened. It was not opened by force, which means a person who knew where the key was participated in the theft. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank led a 13-bank consortium to establish the Central Bank of Iraq. De La Rue was brought in to print up the new Iraqi dinar. This currency has some of the most anti-counterfeit measures of any other currency on the planet, and yet it is completely worthless. Its current value is approximately 1163 to 1 US dollar. But from 1982 until about 1993, one dinar was worth $3.22. There are secrets that George W. Bush guards at least as carefully as any entrusted to a president. Secrets he's forbidden to share even with the vice president. Secrets he's held ever since his days at Yale, where in his senior year, like his father and his grandfather, he belonged to Skull and Bones, the elite secret society whose members include some of the most powerful men of the 20th century. President Bush has tapped five fellow Bonesmen to join his administration. Most recently, the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, William Donaldson, Skull and Bones, 1953. Bones is not restricted to Republicans. Yet another Bonesman has his eye on the Oval Office. Senator John Kerry, Democrat, Skull and Bones, 1966. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? Secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's direction that he's taking the country. We can do a better job, and I intend to do it. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go watch. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the Number website. Number 322. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. Saddam, 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 Saddam Hussein. War and danger. Continuing danger. Hour of danger. Very, very dangerous world. The evil terrorists. 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 Dramatic changes now beginning to occur. John Kerry with 77 electoral votes and George Bush with 66. These men are like this. The only thing that unifies them are skull and bones. Skull and bones will still keep control of the presidency. By our efforts, we have lit a fire as well. A fire in the minds of men. It warms those who feel its power. It burns those who fight its progress. And one day, this untamed fire of freedom will reach the darkest corners of our world. The Bible says that Iraq, which was known in the Bible days as Babylon, will not only emerge in the last days, it will emerge as the wealthiest, most peaceful, most powerful nation on the face of the planet. So the question is, how do we get from the chaos that there has been over the last few years to the wealthiest country on the planet in the last days? Something must get better. Right. So people ask me, are we right. making Iraq safe for the Antichrist or safe for democracy? And it's right. a little bit of both. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. And those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. And you say, with profound gratitude and great humility, I accept your nomination for presidency of the United States. All across America, something is stirring. It's been a whirlwind of activity. Uh, these first hundred days. Finally, I believe that my next hundred days will be so successful I will be able to complete them in 72 days. <laughs>
And on the 73rd day, I will rest. What did uh, the president and the pope uh, talk about this morning? The Vatican positions, you know, don't fall into the usual left and right of American politics. The pope, for example, is for stronger world government. And he just issued an encyclical, a sort of Vatican position paper, calling for much stronger regulation of the financial world. And at the same time, of course, the pope is opposed to abortion and stem cell research, which Mr. Obama favors. E pluribus unum. That was Latin. That's what's inscribed on a quarter. Out of many, one. Of course, the visual highlight was the president touring the pyramids outside and in. Purification, mummification. Self-identification. That looks like me. Look at those ears. <laughs> Separated at birth from a hieroglyphic, but the president's guide saw another resemblance. Mr. President, you look like King Tut. I've been told. Yes, it's true. He should know about King Tut. Dr. Sahi Hawass oversaw scans of Tut's mummy that produced this likeness. The president's trip inspired Egyptians to display decorations calling Obama the new King Tut of the world. But even the new King Tut couldn't budge a pyramid. Still, it's good practice for trying to push peace in the Mideast. Scientists from all over the world are trying to figure out what caused a mysterious blue light to spiral in the sky over Norway on Wednesday. Early yesterday morning, just before dawn, this appeared in the Norwegian sky. A blue light, small at first, growing into a spiral and then disappearing into what appeared to be a black hole. Thousands of Norwegians bombarded the Meteorological Institute to ask what that light could have possibly been. Some feared it could have been a meteor, others a black hole, and there are even those that thought it could be aliens. December 21st, 2010, I looked up and I saw a decapitated blood red head, looked like, floating over the shoulders of Orion at 2.22 in the morning. Oh, by the way, 2.22 in the morning Central Standard Time is 3.22 in the morning Eastern Standard Time. 322 is the coveted number of the Skull and Bone Society, of which the whole Bush family has been strongly associated with, as was Carrie. Two Illuminists, 322. What's that? A skull? A decapitated head on top of a pile of bones? 322. What was happening in Iraq at that very moment? Iraq had just announced the foundation of its newly formed government. And the entire planet, you could look this up for yourself, shook. The, the seismographic monitors that check earthquake activity around the world, Every one of them went into the black that night. What's going on? I don't know. After nearly nine years, our war in Iraq ends this month. Today, I'm proud to welcome Prime Minister Maliki, the elected leader of a sovereign, self-reliant, and democratic Iraq. In the coming years, it's estimated that Iraq's economy will grow even faster than China's or India's. Here's my dinars. I got them. Well, you know, look, I'm I from can't... the Trade Bank of Iraq, the only ATM in the country. No, I, look, this is a country that's resource-based that obviously right. um, has tremendous aid by the U.S., but could be very self-sufficient with all these oil uh, companies that we've been talking about that are exploring, that are exploring, they're about to explore there. And so I told my viewer, look, I can't fight it. I would like to know how best to get it, and it would really be great if, you know, these guys set up these ETFs all the time. How about an ETF right. to play the dinar? That would really be the best way to go. For the first time in two decades, Iraq is scheduled to host the next Arab League summit, and what a powerful message that will send throughout the Arab world. And finally, we're partnering for regional security, for just as Iraq has pledged not to interfere in other nations, other nations must not interfere in Iraq. Iraq's sovereignty must be respected. And let us never forget those who gave us this chance. The untold number of Iraqis who have given their lives. More than one million Americans, military and civilian, who have served in Iraq. Nearly 4,500 fallen Americans gave their last full measure of devotion. Tens of thousands of wounded warriors, and so many inspiring military families. People ask me, are we right. making Iraq safe for the Antichrist or safe for democracy? And right. it's a little bit of both. This is an extraordinary achievement. Nearly nine years in the making. We're building a new partnership between our nations. 
America continues to maintain a high presence in the country, with the largest U.S. embassy in the world located in the capital, Baghdad, with 15,000 members of staff. Before they leave, U.S. forces will have to transfer dozens of bases to the Iraqis and dispose of or ship out thousands of vehicles. Sometimes it's too cumbersome to bring a lot of this equipment back to the U.S., so a lot of it's left on bases. We're leaving over 500 military bases to the Iraqis, both to Iraqi security forces and also to the government. This is a happy occasion for all of us. It is considered one of the most important days for the Iraqi army and Iraqis, which is the day of handing over Sania base from the friendly side to the Iraqi army. Your zodiac sign was determined by Babylonians based on what constellation the sun was in on the day you were born. But astronomers at the Minnesota Planetarium Society point out things have changed over thousands of years. The Earth has shifted on its axis and shifted us up one sign on the zodiac wheel. Right between November 29th and December 17th, there is a new sign. It is Ophiuchus. The constellation is a dude wrestling a snake. Birds, fish, and all kinds of creatures just dropping dead. 8,000 dead turtle doves in Italy. Hundreds of birds dead in Rockwell, Texas. 500 red-winged blackbirds in Louisiana. 3,000 dead red-winged blackbirds in Arkansas. Several hundred dead in Kentucky. On the fish, several hundred snapper fish in New Zealand. Thousands of dead fish in Florida. 40,000 devil crabs in the UK. 80,000 drum fish in Arkansas. Two million spot croakers in Maryland. In the last two weeks, this is all a sign of the apocalypse. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Plans to allow scientists to create embryos of the part human and part animal are set for approval by the official regulator in Britain. of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Look at the size of this thing as seen from space. Records fell. The biggest snowfall in recorded history. And 100 million people will be impacted by this storm. That's one third the population of the United States. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Kind of drives it home a little bit. The majority of that footage that you saw, and the, the ending there, that's all 2011. <laughs> so you see now why I suggest that the date that the ancients were pointing to when they were looking at December 21st, 2012, was really December 21st, 2010. Because if all of that stuff would have followed immediately after 2012, December 21st, boy, everybody would have been like, this is it, this is it, look at that. But it happened in 2010. So, I mean, what, is, what are we to make of all that? Is it, are we looking at the return of, of the Nephilim and this guy? I'm going to suggest the evidence says yes. That's what it looks like to me. And especially if you look into what the, what the uh, secret societies and what, what their view is of Osiris and all of the various rituals and incantations that are all about the raising and resurrection of Osiris, who if o Osiris is Nimrod and Nimrod is Gilgamesh, then the evidence is lining up for the return of this guy one way or another.